I'm here as I would have been here anyway, but I'm also here um, representing Dilly, Dilly Fung, our project for education, who's unfortunately not well at the moment. And so sends you all her very best wishes, but is unable to join this afternoon, but is, a, is very happy and that this particular um, education forum is going ahead with its focus on education for sustainability and we, what we've called bringing the world into our classrooms. Um, I want to thank you all for joining. Um, obviously, we're just coming out of a period of um, strike action, which many people have participated in. And, and I think we think that's slightly impacted on um, people coming along today because there's a, um, but we still thought it was important for this event to go ahead. And we're really looking forward to our discussion this afternoon. Um, I just thought I'd say a couple of brief things about the background to your, our discussions on education for sustainability. Um, and, and then I'm going to hand over to Erica Pani, who's our academic lead for um, sustainable education or education for sustainability, as we call it. And, and, and we've got a really um, exciting, I think, program of events, which interlaces contributions from students as well as contributions from members of faculty across the LSE. And, and really, um, I also want to sort of take my hat off, my, my metaphorical hat off to, to many of the colleagues who are here today who have been working um, valiantly to take discussions forward about what uh, what an initiative in education for sustainability would mean and can mean in the context of LSE and how we've continued to have discussions around terminology, um, what this looks like at the curriculum level, how we partner with students um, throughout the pandemic, but recognizing that people are already, you know, very tired, very um, overwhelmed uh, and have a lot on their plate just to sort of keep the ship afloat. Um, so, so, you know, so, so some of the fruits of that labor will be on, we will be on display this afternoon um, in the presentations from students and the presentations from members of staff. And I think it also reflects the fact that we've tried to um, embed this work with, with, with a ethos of student partnership. We know that sustainability issues um, matter a great deal to our students and, and I and maybe we'll hear from them later maybe they think that we don't as an institution take sustainability seriously enough um, the other person who's not here today who I should give a bit of a shout out to is Charles Jolie who many of you will know as their school's head of sustainability uh, and and um, and I think it's actually thanks to him his galvanizing energy and grace that, that, that this sort of, that we, we have got to where we are today, holding an education forum on education for sustainability, because if you are so interested in strategic documents, which, I, which maybe you shouldn't be, but nonetheless, there is a sustainable, a school sustainability strategic plan, which has a, which has a um, pillar in it um, focused on education. And, and you can have a look at some of the commitments the school has apparently made in the area of education and, and some of which, um, are reflected or we are reflecting back in, in, in the work we're going to be talking about today. So um, I think that's all I wanted to say is just to, to say it's great to see you all that this is actually an exciting area of work where we're keen to kind of ripple out, um, snowball out from the sort of um, team of people within the Eden Center, um, some members of faculty and the sustainability team to, to, to involve a much wider audience alongside our student partners in the sustainability to set sustainable future society and I should also add but Ellis will be able to correct me on this that there have been change makers projects in the past which have also looked at sustainability issues and I'm sure Ellis and um, Lydia if they're here today if if Lydia's here today would be happy to put links to those in the chat as well so I'm going to hand over to Erica now um, to give a second introduction um, Erica Pani is um, an assistant professor or lecturer in the department of Geography and Environment. She was just telling us about a really exciting initiative, partnership initiative with um, RD University and Dar es Salaam, which I think um, lives the values of what we're wanting to talk about today. And as I said, she's also our academic lead for sustainable education. So thanks, Erica. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. And um, uh, yeah, just welcome everybody. Uh, echo Claire's uh, welcome there. And um, thank you, Claire, for, for taking half of my script away from me so that I can't really say who I am anymore because now people know. No, I'm joking with you, of course. Uh, I actually feel extremely lucky uh, to be the current academic lead uh, on this incredibly valuable education for sustainability um, program, uh, if you like, uh, that's run from the school level. 
Uh, as you've probably seen, we have an absolutely great lineup for today's Education for Sustainability uh, Forum. Um, and following my brief introduction, I'll be handing over to Diego Diu, uh, who's from management, and uh, Ilia Ionardi uh, in the Language Centre. Now, they're both students from the Sustainable Future Society at the LSE Student Union, and they'll talk about the students' call to action regarding theirs and our futures. And in many respects, this call for action, I think, uh, sits right at, speaks right to the heart of sustainability uh, as it was originally intended. Uh, it goes back to 1987 with the Brundtland Review um, on sustainability. And one of the, the main ethics is about trying to balance economy, society, and environment, not just for um, this generation, but for generations uh, to follow. And I think that's one of the key issues here about why we want to do this at a school level, uh, because it really does speak to the futures of our students. So hearing their voices uh, in all of this is, is absolutely essential and central to it. Um, now, this was going to be followed by around a 40 minute panel uh, involving insights from colleagues into how they've built education and sustain for sustainability into their own teaching and learning practices. Um, first to take the floor uh, will be Paul Apostolidis from government. Now, he'll talk about the fantastic LSE Public Research Partners uh, project that I mentioned just a couple of uh, minutes ago. Um, he runs that as part of, uh, for himself, as G GV262, uh, which is contemporary political theory. Following um, Paul will be Gillian Terry, uh, who works with LSE 100. She'll go through some of the processes of embedding sustainability into an existing module and designing a new sustainability stream for LSE 100. And as we all know, LSE 100 is a really um, important and foundational course for our undergraduate students across the whole university. So it's really great that uh, we'll get to hear Gillian's experiences um, on that. Finally, uh, Ganga uh, Shridhar from Sky Psychology and Behavioral Science will share her experiences of integrating uh, sustainability into a quantitative methods teaching. And I'm so excited uh, to, to hear about this because I've been sort of thinking to myself, how, how would you do that? Um, and so uh, it, uh, it will be great to hear uh, from her. And it's also around uh, designing a dedicated course. So uh, again, I think we're really lucky to have those three presenters and thank you very much to you all for uh, agreeing to do this. Now, following that, we'll uh, go into breakout rooms to discuss what we've heard from the panel speakers and to perhaps reflect on how we might be able to either start to embed or further embed notions of sustainability into our own teaching and learning processes. I know I would find it really helpful to discuss some of my ideas with colleagues and to hear what others are considering. And I think that kind of feedback would be really helpful. And in fact, Ellis Saxe, who's also a very key player um, from the Eden Center uh, on this project, will lead the summary of feedback from the, the breakout rooms. Then before Claire closes the whole uh, uh, forum off, we'll then return very importantly to Diego and Ilya, who will present the recent work done by um, the students for Sustainability Future Society on where the school is at in terms of its sustainability offering. Um, and again, I think this is a great that it'll give us some insights um, that we can all try to maybe build upon in our forward facing um, trajectory uh, in terms of this very important uh, topic. Now, with regard to looking forward, I think we're all very aware of the importance of trying to embed sustainability into our education strategy. I mean, the school has six main areas of focus in its sustainable, uh, sustainability strategic plan, including research, investment, collaboration, engagement, and leadership, the school itself, and of course, education. I think I've remembered them all. Um, I counted them on my fingers as I went, which is a really good technique if you have to count, by the way. Um, the idea 
with the latter is that by embedding sustainability into the curriculum, it enables us, the school, to act uh, on its commitments to the current generation and future generations of students. As LE LSE educators, we can then engage with students and help motivate them to consider a topic that they're absolutely passionate about, maybe in uh, collaborating with them um, or for their dissertations or for their assessments, uh, whatever it is that you guys all think is appropriate for you and for your group of students. And in so doing, it helps students to develop their own critical thinking, which can't be a bad thing. On the other hand, if we see it from the other perspective, for students engaging more deeply with sustainability may actually help them to prepare for some very complex challenges that they may face ahead, um, particularly in seeing sustainability as a shared responsibility, regardless of one's role. So I think that that kind of um, two-way interconnections between uh, faculty at, as educators and students as learners, but students also as educators of us, is a very important uh, relationship for us, hopefully, to build on. Um, as you'll see from today's presentations, there are myriad ways of doing this. So there's no one size fits all design. And I think, again, this is really important because this is about students and staff getting together um, around sustainability, around the sustainability table in ways that suit them. Um, we can do it independently, we can do it as teams, we can do it in group work, however it suits us. Um, and we'll be hearing about participatory learning strategies and collaborative learning. And through all of this, we'll hopefully pick up some really good directions on what more we can all do should we wish to. And again, it's really important to emphasize that this is a voluntary trajectory um, uh, and not something that's being imposed by anybody onto anyone's shoulders. And of course, there will be future events, including workshops run hopefully with a, the assistance of a dedicated um, program manager for the Education for Sustainability uh, project. This is still to be confirmed, but we're moving again, hopefully in the right direction with that. So I think really without any further ado, um, I'll hand over to Diego uh, and Ilya uh, from the Students uh, for Sustainable Futures Society. Um, and they will talk about the students' call to action regarding theirs and our futures. Thank you both very much. Hi, so I'm Diego. I'm a second year student studying management. And unfortunately, Ilya can't join us because she is catching a flight. And I also do apologize if I have to meet at any point and cough. I've had COVID for the past week. So today's my first day of being better. But yeah, I've been inside for about a week since Thursday. So um, yeah, I'm just going to share screen. And I have a few slides where I'm just going to talk about firstly, um, the student call to action. Okay, so we, I am part of the Sustainable Futures Society and within the society, there are a lot of different projects which are trying to create tangible change within LSE of creating a more sustainable experience. So these vary in a lot of different ways from the more direct ways of the waste campaigns of trying to show LSE how they can reduce the waste and encourage recycling on campus to different divestment um, alliances where we want LSE to uh, be more transparent about their investments. And then there's also the embedding sustainability um, project, which I'm a part of alongside Ilya with the um, help of Alice, the co-president of the society. So embedding sustainability is a project where we want different departments and all basically all different departments to embed sustainable teaching within different modules that may not be seen as relevant before. So I think before I go into what's the like how our project is going so far, I think I'll talk about that at the end. And I think it would be really good to start off this forum with what our findings are so far. So first of all, our experience with our degrees, I know personally with management, I've um, 
I have experienced actually some quite good teaching um, relevant to sustainability. I know that I've had some courses, for example, operations management, which may not have been seen as something where sustainability is directly relevant. However, there were parts of that course that were added. And this was in my first term of my first year. We had a we had a week based off of the case for sustainable operations within businesses and talking about how that impacts operations management, what impacts the decision making of managers um, in relation to sustainability and looking at it, um, looking at both sides of the debate essentially. So I think personally, Ilya and I are quite lucky to have had good experiences within our degrees of um, sustainable teaching. And we have seen how doing degrees that aren't directly related to environmental issues still have very relevant aspects in terms of sustainability. So our project, we have collected from our student ambassadors um, examples for each department of different sustainable ideas and um, certain modules that maybe could be made compulsory or could be kind of brought forward into earlier years. And we have also seen examples of other universities in, for example, the statistics department or the anthropology department of how they have embedded sustainability within their degrees in a way that LSE hasn't yet. So we have collected a lot of student insights, most of which have been from the library of just stopping people and asking them to um, take a survey. And we have not completed the insights yet, but we do have a lot of interesting findings as we are watching the survey results come in and we are spreading the survey around to different students. So, some of the most interesting ones I have summarized here. So half of the survey respondents have experienced no improvement in their knowledge of environmental issues during their time at LSE. And I think that is the most telling of the results so far. I think, I think a lot of people would question how well is LSE kind of preparing students for the future um, for such a topic such as sustainability to become so pressing when only half of the survey respondents have experienced an improvement in their knowledge. So I think that expresses a lot of the urgency of the situation. And we also found that 77% of respondents believe that environmental sustainability should be integrated within their degree. So there is still a little bit of a disparity. There is still a little bit of a gap to close in terms of students really do have that demand that they do believe that sustainability is relevant to their degree. Um, and yet there is still some work to be done in terms of the teaching. That is what this survey would suggest. However, I am saying survey respondents, I'm not saying students in general, because um, we have in relation to the 10,000 students at LSE, obviously the survey is not going to be completely representative. So I think this is a good kind of starting point. And some of the quotes from students that I have found, I have found that when we've asked students about what their experience was like, and they have logged their experience in terms of how they felt about learning about sustainability when it was, in, when it was integrated, they have found it hugely insightful. They find it very interesting and it, in kind of, it does inspire them to think about it in terms of more of a sustainable career. And by embedding sustainable teaching, we have found that students will consider sustainable career paths and careers within maybe green finance or something, they're more likely to consider those sorts of careers um, when sustainability is more integrated within the degree. However, there were a few comments saying that they found it incomplete. They found that it was added on as an extra, as an option, but it was not, um, it was not quite there yet. So that is the essence of what we are finding so far. And the aim of our project is we will summarize all of our findings, which will be well-rounded into a report by the end of the year, but that's going to require some interviews. It's going to require different kinds of research, more responses on the survey. So everything is tentative um, so far. And then finally, I just wanted to include a little snippet. Obviously this is not readable. This is not for everyone to read all of this on the slide right now. Um, but I just wanted to include a small screenshot of part of the Excel sheet of the kind of examples that we're finding from our student ambassadors. So along the top are the some of the different departments, so international relations, international history, anthropology, and our student ambassadors who um, study in these departments have gone out and they have found examples from different universities, for example, SOAS or Harvard or different universities where they have 
um, included sustainable teaching and things that could be included then at LSE. So we will have this summarized into a table and this will also form part of our report. So that is the first thing that I was going to talk about. Um, this represents the student demand or what we understand about it so far. And I think it expresses the kind of urgency of the situation and what students really want from their teachers. That's super, Diego. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, you, the work that you're doing is really very interesting. Can I just ask, how have you found it in terms of doing the survey itself? Uh, was it easy to design? How did you go about it? The survey, I think it was quite straightforward to design because I think it's quite a straightforward thing that we want to find out. We want to find out how, what their experience is in terms of sustainability. Do they think it's relevant? Are they receiving that teaching? Um, I think I've experienced, I kind of underestimated the student interest in it at the beginning. I thought it was going to be really hard to find student ambassadors, people willing to take time out of their day to complete a survey, which isn't going to directly help them. Um, but I have noticed a lot of student interest. We got far more responses than we expected. Within a couple of days, we got 50 responses, which was quite good. And um, we have student ambassadors for each department that are willing to really help us with their project, do their own research. So yeah, I found it really rewarding and really kind of inspiring to see people being really proactive with it. How many um, students are involved uh, with the society itself? Um, on this particular side of the project? So it's a very big society. I believe we have around 30 different members all working on different projects. And just in this project, there is basically two of us. It's just Ilya and I on this project. And we get a lot of assistance from the co-president, Alice. Um, so yeah, there's three of us in this project. And what inspired you to do it yourself? I think I, before I came to university, I never really considered sustainable teaching within my classes. I was going to study management and I never really considered how sustainability would come into that, even though I'm really passionate about the issue. And then in week three of Michaelmas term, we, and in operations management, we discussed the case for sustainable operations and how that's not an external issue. How does like sustainable operations, how can it impact the decisions, the decisions of managers and how can it be even good for the business itself. So I think seeing it intertwined with my course made me really inspired for this whole kind of idea. So that's when I kind of tried, that's when I applied to take part in this project and hopefully kind of bring that kind of experience to other students who may, who may not have thought about it before because there's still that 23% of students who didn't believe it was relevant, but maybe I would have been a part of that before I experienced that sustainable teaching integrated within my course. So yeah, that's why I'm quite passionate about it. Brilliant. And just like one final question, if I may, uh, before we move on to the next session, but what are you hoping to get from uh, the embedding of sustainability into teaching and learning for yourself and for your, co your other colleagues? Yeah, so it's a very ambitious project, but we would hopefully like to see some change within the teaching. We want to be a part of the drive to, um, to more sustainable teaching, essentially. We want to hopefully represent that student push on the student side for wanting to see um, environmental issues being covered within their courses. So hopefully if we could speed up the process or I guess put more pressure on the process of um, including sustainable teaching within different departments, that is, what we would hope to do and that's what we'd be delighted to hopefully achieve um, at some point. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. I mean, it's a, an inspiration, I'm sure, to uh, many of us here who uh, really want to respond to that call. So thank you very much um, for making it so eloquently. Um, OK, so just to uh, move over then, we're going to go to our panel um, session. And first up is uh, Paul. Apostolides, uh, as I said, from government. Um, Paul, the ability to uh, share your screen is there if you would like it. Please okay. do introduce yourself, etc. Et that should work. Does everybody see that uh, screen? Great, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Um, 
thanks for being here today. And I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Um, thanks, Erica, for uh, hosting and for uh, chairing the panel. Thank you, Diego, uh, to you and your fellow students for the work that you're doing. I think it's really important that you um, keep uh, going strong on this because uh, we want to hear the student voices on, on these issues. So um, I'm going to kick things off for the panel by talking about a civically engaged research project that I've been supervising over the past two years that brings my students together with a UK-based climate action group called Hope for the Future. Uh, so first, a few words about the institutional and conceptual architecture for this partnership. So I've been fortunate enough to have this effort supported by the LSE Student Futures Experiential Learning Initiative that Dilly directs. And I actually coordinate the civic engagement strand of Student Futures. And I'll tell you right up front that the partnership I'm discussing is meant to model an activity that other faculty colleagues could take up if they're keen to do so. Um, reciprocity is the core value that underlies um, this collaborative project with Hope for the Future. So the idea is that all parties uh, uh, contribute and gain tangible things from working together to produce public-oriented research. Students get to learn and apply new research skills, uh, learning how to analyze public problems in ways that bridge academic inquiry and public action. The external partner, which in this case is an NGO, but which also could be a public agency or a social enterprise, acquires information and analysis that they probably otherwise would not have the resources or the time or the expertise to generate on their own. And as a faculty member, I find it very exciting to um, witness students deepen their understanding of political theoretical concepts by engaging in practical efforts to address climate challenges with professionals who do this every day. It also thrills me to give my students a taste of academic research, to interact with them as co-investigators, and often um, I gain new material that contributes to my own individual research agenda. So I run this as an optional activity in a large undergraduate course, uh, GV262, uh, with minor assessments that can be adapted to include reflection on the results from the research. But I've also organized such projects in the past as integral and compulsory course components, and they work just as well that way. Now, Hope for the Future, I'll tell you a little bit about the organization. So uh, they describe themselves as a climate charity that equips UK communities, groups, and individuals to communicate about the urgency of climate change with elected political leaders. Uh, they offer training and support to help constituents engage productively with MPs and with public officials uh, at lower levels of government on climate change through democratic processes. They also produce a set of handy policy resources on a range of climate issues ranging from uh, green jobs to carbon pricing uh, to housing and various priorities that were addressed at COP26. The organization works with all kinds of people, uh, but they do special outreach with youth and faith groups. And in fact, I'm grateful to LSE's Faith Center for initially putting me in touch with them. So. Uh, as I said, I've been running projects with Hope for the Future uh, over the past two years. Last year's project was premised on the idea, validated by Hope for the Future's experiences, that public officials who at first don't have much interest in climate change can be moved to take action on climate issues if constituents build relationships with them over time. Of course, for elected leaders to make such journeys, constituents have to work with them in sustained ways. So the question for last year concerned how people whom Hope for the Future trains and supports can become motivated uh, to engage in long-term advocacy and how HFDF can encourage this. So six of my students interviewed two or three participants in Hope for the Future's programs about why they would become active in climate advocacy and what kept them going even when they went through the inevitable periods of feeling discouraged or exhausted. Maybe the most useful finding for Hope for the Future was that these citizens craved a stronger sense of community in their advocacy efforts. So it turns out that reaching out to MPs and trying to cultivate one-to-one -one relationships with them can be quite isolating. So now, with the benefit of our students' research, uh, which was cogently synthesized into a final report by a student intern last summer, Hope for the Future has been developing new programs to help people experience more teamwork when they carry out these kinds of activities. 
Uh, as you might imagine, carrying out a project like this requires unusual efforts by the supervising faculty member. Uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit about that aspect of what this entails. Um, there are important preparatory steps like agreeing terms of reference for the project that spell out mutual responsibilities, timeframes, and expected benefits. Um, I also laid groundwork for the students' inquiries by developing the question protocol cooperatively before the term began with hope for the future, and then getting our project approved by LSE's Research Ethics Committee. And then there was the work of overseeing the teaching assistance that a GTA provided for the project, coordinating special meetings for the students with hope for the future, and <clears throat> engaging and supervising the summer intern. But all this being said, a project like this has to be a group effort if it's going to succeed. Um, so a lot of other people contributed and really did their utmost. Um, we have a data management specialist, Hannah at the library, um, who gave the students vital training in how to handle research data responsibly and securely. The students impressed me to no end with their earnest devotion to the project's success and the perceptiveness of their analyses. Um, by meeting with students about their blogs, uh, which Hope for the Future eventually published, my GTA also contributed greatly. He helped ensure that engaging with concrete climate politics had a mutually invigorating relationship to students' readings in environmental political theory and democratic political theory. And then our summer intern last year, a student named Olivia Hipworth, uh, she pulled it all together in her eloquently written and precisely argued synthetic report. Um, furthermore, keep in mind that everyone accomplished all of these things uh, under the trying conditions of the pandemic. Uh, and um, thanks to Boris Johnson for declaring it over. Um, and uh, also, you know, as you can see, working entirely online. Uh, so I think that's a testament to what sustainability-oriented education can accomplish, even when traveling to explore different parts of the planet or even meet people in one's own city isn't possible or isn't desirable. Um, lastly, then, here's a bit about the new project that's underway right now for this partnership. And this one examines how local government, uh, local council governments can make a difference on climate issues and how constituents can most effectively communicate with their local officials to encourage them to take action. So this term, my students are interviewing counselors all across the UK to find out their perspectives on these questions. They've been coming up with some interesting findings so far, notably real disagreement over how much councils can do to prevent and respond to the flooding problems that are associated with climate change in the UK. We are all enjoying our newfound opportunities this year to meet together in person. And of course, this makes it easier to plan peer collaboration for the students, which is something that last year's cohort said that they valued and would have loved to do even more of. Um, so thanks for listening. That's what I've got. And I'd be happy to answer questions that anyone might have about either the substance or the methods of this sustainability research and educational partnership. Also, um, I actually operate another research partnership in GV262, which investigates labor issues in today's precarious economy. I love doing both of these projects, but the labor project is somewhat closer to my research interests although climate change is an issue in my work with Latino workers and community groups in the US. But in any case, my thought is that going forward, if um, a faculty colleague uh, who specializes in climate matters might be interested in taking forward the partnership with Hope for the Future, I'd be very, very willing to explore that possibility. So um, thanks again, Erica and, and everyone. And uh, Thank you very, very much, Paul. That was superb and really inspirational. I'm going to open it up to the floor for uh, questions. Um, we've got five minutes or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer for some questions. Please do ask Paul um, anything that you would like and just turn your mics off and, and ask away. Or you can do the protocol of raising your hand. It's up to you. OK, so Ellis, we've got a question. Yes, thank you so much. It's uh, fascinating stuff. I was really interested in how you were saying that um, it kind of invigorated students take on um, the more theoretical side of it. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I, I suppose I just anything else you had to say about that and, and that there wasn't a sense that they were shifting away from kind of what might be considered core content, but that it did give them a bit right. more of a lease on that. 
Yeah, you know, so with with projects like this, and um, you know, in the general area of community based learning and experiential learning, there is a kind of knee jerk tendency I have found over the years, perfectly understandable, but I think um, just ripe for criticism, <laughs> to dichotomize crudely between you know academic work and quote unquote real world um, activities, and I have always. Um, argued mightily against seeing it that way. I think that, that, that the best approach is one that sees this as a bridging activity where there's a, actually a kind of dialectic where the one is informing the other and enriching the other and deepening the critical capacities that we bring to these discussions. Um, and um, so the students, the one way that this happens in terms of students uh, growth in their critical encounters with political theory texts of the course is when they write blogs where I challenge them to write about uh, a selected theme from one of the interviews in conversation with a concept or an argument from a political theoretical text. And they've done some marvelous work. I mean, it's not all, you know, top rank, obviously, but, 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 but a lot of it is, is, is pretty amazing and good enough for hope for the future to want to publish all these blogs on their site, even though there is this academic component, and it is, an, is not an entirely practical um, uh, uh, enterprise. So for example, we read uh, a democratic theorist who writes about network politics, as opposed to movement politics, um, you know, where there's a more decentralized, uh, a, a sort of more emphatic uh, uh, commitment to decentralizing power within uh, a network of environmental groups and more horizontal relations rather than a vertical structure of authority. And his idea is that that actually generates more power vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, let's say, corporate interests that are opposed to sustainability than if you simply had a more rigidly top-down uh, kind of model. Uh, so students do really good good work in that, in that regard. Um, and then on the other side of it, it's uh, our partners really appreciate you know the opportunity to engage in more theoretical discussions than is, than they commonly get to do in the midst of their policy action brilliant thank you very much uh anybody else got some questions otherwise i've got one i must say got two maybe three maybe four <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, the first one that i'd like to ask you paul really is um the importance of the partnership here mm. um could you tell us a little bit more about maybe uh, the, the importance of their role and uh, then as a key player in terms of this bridge between government and climate, et cetera, et cetera? Mm. Well, you mean the partnership, you mean the, the role of hope for the future? Hope for the future. The yeah. yeah, I mean, so, um, I mean, the, the first thing I'll say is that I feel like I cannot, like it is literally impossible to express enough my appreciation for their work with me and with our students. I view them as co-educators in this, in this project. And you know, they, um, I'm happy to say, are never trying to miss an opportunity to thank me for having the students work with them and produce this analysis for them, um, which is great to hear. And I'm really glad that, that you know, they find what the students do genuinely useful and, and sometimes inspiring. At the same time, I think what they what they are doing is giving the students anchors in you know the world of practical negotiations over environmental issues, policy issues, and um, the thinking of public officials. In the case of the project this year at the council level, um, that the students just wouldn't have otherwise. You know, they can think in the abstract about network politics and the local dimensions of a larger environmental movement. But then to have the counselors sort of talk about their misgivings, or, you know, or uh, aspirations for dealing with floods uh, when they happen in certain places in the UK, that just clarifies what's at stake and also the, the traction of the concepts in, in, in ways that are otherwise um, not available. Now, the partnership itself, I, like, I, I can't emphasize enough also how important reciprocity is, and that means including the partners every step of the way in the design of the project, rather than thinking that you can come to someone and say, here's what I'd like to do with your organization. It just works better for everyone if you, you know, collaborate on putting together the design of the project, the kinds of questions you're gonna ask, um, the sorts of methods the students will employ, and what you want the products to look like. 
Yeah, no, those are that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions, guys? No, if not, I'm going to ask one more, Paul. Um, Thanks, Erica. Is <laughs> put you on the spot. No, you did mention that um, uh, this has been run both as a compulsory element of the course and mm. as voluntary. And I just wondered if you could give us some insights into the differences that you found between running it in the two different ways. Mm. Yes, so I should be more specific. So I, uh, at the LSE, I have only run it as, an, as a voluntary component of my large undergraduate course, which has 96 students. There's no way I could possibly coordinate these kinds of par partnerships for all 96. So I, you know, advertise it as an opportunity and I get a very motivated self-selected group of, you know, 12 to 15 students, about 15 yeah, each year um, who are, are interested in doing it, even though, you know, they don't have to. Uh, and that's just worked really, really well. So when I used to teach in the United States uh, before I came to the LSE several years ago, I did commonly have this as a compulsory activity uh, within a course. The thing was that in the US, the semesters where I was teaching were longer, you know, about almost 50% longer than our terms. And so it was more realistic to ask students to produce a final report um, that synthesized the, the research results over that uh, period of time. Um, uh, however, <laughs> there was a tendency I mean, I think what people need to be aware of, uh, you know, based on my own experience, is a tendency for this thing to, these kinds of projects to just inflate themselves. I'm sure you can relate to this, Erica, yes. given the work that you do, um, because there's always more to do. And you can get into a trap of setting expectations for the time people are going to commit, your own and the students and the partners, um, that, 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 that become too burdensome. So I actually have really appreciated the discipline um, that I've had to you know, to adapt um, in order to have these activities fit well in an optional framework in a 10 week term. That's brilliant. Um, very, very briefly, Paul, as an answer, because um, uh, I would like to move to oh. Gillian Terry, but Claire has asked a really important question in the chat, which is what do you think would enable the broader rollout of these important project opportunities at the LSE? 30 seconds. Well, yep. Yeah, uh, more support for faculty time. Uh, the, the faculty members who are interested in this, uh, in doing it, they are very motivated to provide outstanding educational experiences for their students. And they need the time to do the other things that that one slide showed you um, is just frankly a lot of extra hours uh, compared to the teaching that we normally do. I would agree. Thank you very much. Absolutely super presentation. Uh, and thank you for your insights. Really great. Um, Gillian, Gillian Terry from LSE uh, 100. I'm going to hand over to you. You have the ability to share your screen. Please go ahead if you'd like to. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, I am going to share my screen or try to at least. Can I just confirm, do you see my slides or do you see the notes page? No. Oh. Note page. Slide Note. and the next slide. That's better. Yeah, OK. I still haven't gotten used to that dual monitor thing. Um, OK, so hello, everybody. My name is, is Jillian Terry, and I'm one of the co-directors of LSE 100. Um, and huge thanks to everybody involved with the planning and organization of the education forum, uh, and to Erica for, for chairing the forum today, for inviting, for inviting me to come along and to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing in LSE 100 to embed sustainability into interdisciplinary education. Um, I did sort of come to the realization just a moment ago that maybe some people in the room are new to LSE uh, or just new to thinking about undergraduate education at LSE and maybe are not as familiar with LSE 100. So I will just briefly um, introduce it. Uh, LSE 100 is the school's flagship interdisciplinary course that is taken by all first year undergraduate students at the school. So it's an assessed half unit course that students take across Michaelmas term and Lent term. Uh, and it's a course that brings students together from all 
undergraduate departments. They're mixed uh, in seminars together. And we take a flipped classroom format where we give students some short pre-recorded video lectures from academics um, from around the school. And then we engage them in thinking about sort of the biggest social issues of our time uh, in fortnightly seminars. So that is what we do at LSE 100. If you have you know, sort of more general questions at the end, I'm certainly happy to take take those. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about two key projects that we are working on at LSE 100 uh, in relation to sustainability. And so um, Erica sort of previewed this earlier. The first is to embed sustainability themes into the existing version of LSE 100. And this is something that we have done this year. Um, the, current module, the current module that we are running is called How Can We Control AI? So it's an interdisciplinary module that investigates the, the social, political, and economic impacts of artificial intelligence uh, from a variety of, of social scientific perspectives. Uh, and what we did this year is, is to think about how we embed sustainability education into our teaching uh, on that module. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. The second project uh, is something that is currently in development. We are uh, in the planning stages of developing a new stream of LSE 100, which is going to foreground sustainability. And our tentative uh, sort of title for that stream is how can we reverse ecological collapse? And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, our plans and what we're, what we're up to uh, in thinking about um, that new stream. So just very briefly, um, thinking about what we've done this year on sustainability and AI. So this is the third iteration of the AI module for LSE 100. Um, this year it's taken by over 1800 students. So we have a teaching team of uh, 10 uh, in total, including myself and the other co-director and a, a group of eight fantastic fellows who are working with us to teach the course. Um, and this year we really thought um, quite quite um, substantively about how to foreground two sort of different components of sustainability into this module. And to be honest, the first two iterations of the AI module didn't really take into account sustainability in a big way. We were much more focused on some of the other impacts of artificial intelligence uh, that we were seeing and, and discussing those, you know, using interdisciplinary perspectives. But this year, what we did is we thought about how we could foreground both sustainability of AI so actually thinking about how AI is or is not sustainable as a, as a new and emerging technology, a technology set of technologies that's increasingly important for all of us. Uh, but then we also thought about the sort of reverse of that, which is AI for sustainability. So how we might be able to use and draw on AI driven technologies to promote um, and enable a, a more sustainable future. So those are the two sort of ways that we were thinking about this. Um, one of the the things that we did is we highlighted Kate Crawford's recent work. One of she's one of the leading scholars on on AI and its impacts, um, and her newest book Atlas of AI, which I highly highly recommend. And we got our students to read some some of that book for for the course this year. Um, focuses on the physical and planetary impacts of AI, as you might pick up on from the word Atlas in the title. Um, we also had. Uh, LSE academic contributions from a variety of colleagues around the school, uh, including Julia Corwin and her work on e-waste, uh, Eugenie Dugoya and her work on um, economic, uh, economic and technological change. And she talked in a video for us about some really interesting work on sort of AI um, in enabling sort of smart uh, power grids to promote more efficient energy use. Uh, and then also we had contribution from James Rising from, from the Grantham Institute. So we focused a lot on this question or this concept of AI as an extractive industry. And this was one of our ways in for thinking about how to embed notions of sustainability into discussions that we were having with our students about artificial intelligence. And I think it, it, it was def certainly the case this year that our first year students came into the course thinking about AI as a, um, as a particular type of technology without necessarily considering its physical impacts. So it's AI is, is thought of as quite digital, right? Whereas actually AI has huge um, environmental impacts on the development of these technologies. Um, so one of the ways that we did that was thinking about this role of AI as an extractive industry. So these are some photographs um, 
that we used, uh, David Meisel from, uh, did some photography for Wired a couple of years ago. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and these are examples of, um, on the left, you have uh, lit some lithium mining uh, in Chile um, at the Salar de Acama salt flats, uh, which actually provides more than a quarter of the world's lithium supplies. Uh, and then on the right, you have uh, copper mining also in Chile. Uh, and copper and lithium as two of the natural resources that are you know, most in need uh, for the data intensive uh, AI technologies that are being developed and used right now. And so we, we had conversations with students and we really engaged them in this discussion about the, the physical and the planetary impacts uh, of AI. So that was sort of a conceptual frame that we used to bring sustainability into our discussions of AI in LSE 100. Um, I know you're not going to be able to, to see any of the student comments here, but this is a, a, an activity that we did with our students in Michaelmas term. So in Michaelmas term, we were still on Zoom with LSE 100. And so this is a mural um, activity that we got students to engage with, where we actually got them to think about six different um, local contexts and consider how AI is being used uh, and is also impacting on those communities. So from the huge um, data centers in Columbia, Washington, to the e-waste that we're seeing in South Delhi, India, to the um, lithium mining in Bolivia, uh, we got students to really consider from the, this is, and we actually did this in the very first class of the year. And so we got students to immediately consider what those planetary and physical impacts, environmental impacts of these technologies are. And this is something that we sort of foregrounded and made sure that students were able to scaffold their learning on throughout the, throughout the course. The other way that we did this, and I think this is really important um, in terms of you know, potentially taking lessons forward for other colleagues to, to think about embedding sustainability in their own modules, is we provided student choice in assessment that gave students the opportunity to explore and investigate sustainability themes. So we have two assessments on LSE 100. One is an individual written piece uh, where we ask students this year to analyze an algorithmic decision-making system and basically recommend whether or not it should be used in future. And then the second assessment is an interdisciplinary group research project with a report output at the end, a report and presentation. And in that assessment, groups of five students, interdisciplinary groups, are investigating AI within a particular system of their choosing. And so in both assessments, students could choose algorithms and systems that focused on sustainability themes. So it, in a sense, we offered a sort of choose your own adventure for LSE 100 students in that students who were keen to take that sustainability learning further had the opportunity to do that in their assessments, in both of their assessments. Um, so these are just a couple of examples of algorithmic systems that students could choose from uh, for their first term assessment. So they could write about um, DeepMind's autonomous data center cooling system, which is a, a, a very sophisticated um, set of algorithms that DeepMind has developed to essentially uh, cool data centers in a more sustainable way. Uh, and then they were all, a lot of our students also ended up writing about PAWS, which is the protection assist for wildlife security, which is essentially an AI for um, to detect poaching and to prevent poaching uh, in, in certain contexts. So students wrote about both of those um, algorithmic decision-making systems in the, in the Michaelmas term. And now in the Lent term, we have groups that are focusing on sustainability uh, themes and are thinking about essentially how to either control or constrain the impact of AI for sustainability or how to use AI to actually promote or enable a more sustainable future. And so they're getting to do this, you know, both through their individual writing, but also in their, uh, in their interdisciplinary group projects as well. And I think fundamentally, one of the things that we foreground in LSE 100, and this has been the case for a number of years, is the systems thinking and systems change frameworks. Um, for those of you who are familiar with systems thinking, um, it, it is a, a framework that derives from, in, in huge, uh, you know, to, to a large amount, I think, um, environmental activism and sustainability. So Danella Meadows um, is one of the sort of key systems thinkers. She was an environmental activist and helped us think about how we make change in complex systems. Um, this quote from John Sturman, another leading systems thinker um, scholar, talks about you know, this, the development of systems thinking as crucial for the survival of humanity. 
And so at LSE, we're also quite lucky to have some experts in systems thinking. Um, I've included here a photo of Savas Verdas, who is one of the co-directors of the executive MSC in cities. Uh, and Savas is an expert in systems thinking and systems change, and has actually provided video lectures for our students on those topics to help them uh, frame some of those discussions that they were having. So I'll very, very briefly then just tell you um, what we're doing in the future. So that was what we've done this year. That's how we've embedded sustainability into the AI module. Thinking ahead, um, from next year, first year undergraduates will choose from one from three possible streams of LSE 100. And this is the first time ever that students will have a choice of what version of LSE 100 they take. Um, so there are three modules that we are developing. Uh, one will be a revised version of the AI stream. Um, we'll have a brand new sustainability stream, which is what I'll talk about in a moment. And then we'll also have a stream on fairness. So the sustainability stream that we're currently developing uh, with the tentative title, how can we reverse ecological collapse? Um, again, as is our practice at LSE 100, we've got existing and planned academic contributions from um, over a dozen departments at the school to really represent the breadth of research that's going on around the school on sustainability related uh, issues. We have some indicative themes um, that I've listed here on the slide, sort of to give you a flavor of the types of things students will engage with uh, during their time on the module uh, for those students who choose the sustainability stream. And I should also say that even though there will be these three separate streams of LSE 100, uh, there is a, a core commitment to uh, interdisciplinarity and systems thinking across all three streams. So as we've done this year with AI, there will be opportunities for those students on other streams to engage with sustainability as well throughout the year. So even those students who don't choose this stream in particular, all LSE 100 students will, will be exposed to those ideas around um, sustainability and environmental themes, drawing on the research uh, of the school. And speaking of yeah, engaging with LSE research, just a, a, a small flavor of what we have been thinking about in relation to this new stream. Um, we're planning to draw on the, the excellent project that has been happening at Grantham on the climate change laws of the world and get students to actually use some of that uh, fantastic research that's been done by, by colleagues at Grantham about some of the legislation that is in place for um, mandating particular policies and, and laws around climate change. Um, we've also, we're also planning to actually engage students with the LSE Sustainability Strategic Plan to, to read it, to think about it, to analyze it, to understand what it means for their institution to make certain commitments towards a, a more sustainable future. And then, as I mentioned, we've got academic contributions from, from colleagues around the school like Eugenie Dugoya, like Julia Corwin, and will engage LSE 100 students with their research in order to actually demonstrate what LSE is doing on sustainability um, and expose students who perhaps come from departments where they wouldn't necessarily hear about that type of work um, in LSE 100. And finally, very briefly, I'll just say that we are working in close partnership with students to develop um, this new stream of LSE 100. So I'm really thankful to Diego and to Ilya from Sustainable Futures. We've had some great conversations with them about what this might look like and what LSE students want when it comes to a sustainability module of LSE 100. Uh, we've also had excellent conversations with the Climate Emergency Collective, um, and we're hoping to develop a partnership as well with the LSE SU Green Finance Society. Um, so student partnerships are at the heart of what we do at LSE 100 and are certainly you know, the reason why we are doing a lot of this work um, is because students have asked for it and students want to engage more explicitly with sustainable sustainability, um, climate related environmental themes. Um, so I will end it there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, my email address is there if you have questions, our website, but also please do check out our Moodle, which is available open enrollment if you'd like to see some of the fantastic um, content and resources that we have had from other colleagues around the school as well. Thank you very much. That's absolutely superb, Gillian. Thank you so much. Really great presentation uh, and really inspiring um, work. We've got a few minutes for some quick questions. Um, if anybody has a particular question that they would like to ask. Anybody like to start the ball rolling? 
No? Okay, well, uh, Gillian, I've always got questions for people. So um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, this one. Something that uh, we're trying to sort of talk to colleagues about in thinking about embedding um, sustainability into their own teaching and learning processes is around the fact that you don't need to be necessarily a climate change expert yourself. Uh, and I think that that's really important. Uh, it's also the, the notion of sustainability is around that sort of balance between society, economy and environment. And of course, environment right now is playing very largely on students' minds uh, because of the, the climate issue uh, and the, the emergency uh, that it is. Um, but I just wonder um, from your own experiences, how much of this did you know before? How much have you learned as you've gone along? Um, can you give us some insights into that? Absolutely, yeah. So I, uh, yeah, a huge amount of this we have learned as we've gone along. Um, our previous director, Jessica Templeton, was more, uh, I think her expertise, her scholarly expertise was more closely affiliated to sort of sustainability and climate negotiations and that kind of thing. Um, so she was certainly crucial in some of the early development of this work. But for most of us, the most of us working on the development of this new stream and the, the redevelopment of the AI stream, we are not climate change experts. We're not sustainability experts in our own scholarly work. I'm an international relations scholar by training. So of course I come at it with a very international global uh, frame, but I think all of us, we, we are a very interdisciplinary team. And I think so much of what we have tried to do is to think about the core, um, I guess, ideas and themes we want to uh, investigate with students and then think about, right, what are the various dimensions of those ideas or themes that we have to link to the environment, to climate, to other elements of, you know, the economy and the society, as you said, Erica, the other pillars of sustainability to think more critically about what a sustainable future would actually look like. Um, because fundamentally at LSE 100, we try to equip students to make positive change. And so to do that through interdisciplinary investigation, but also to do that by then going back to their home departments and interrogating and thinking critically about what it is that they're doing in their, in their um, sort of predominant discipline and what that means for, you know, their future work. And so I think yeah, absolutely. I, I think not all of us are experts in these areas um, or were experts, you know, before we started this development. And really, it's been collaboration with colleagues um, and with students that's been crucial to, to, the, to the successful development of this. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any other questions? Yes, I actually had a question for Jillian. Um, it was actually, it was really nice to see the presentation because I know we spoke about this last time. So it was really nice to see how everything is like coming together. Um, I had a question about, so you mentioned a lot of students were choosing the kind of sustainability um, aspects for their projects. I was wondering what kind of levels of interest you're seeing, is it very few students? Is it a lot of students like, yeah, how is that looking? What are your insights on that? Yeah, thank you, Diego. We actually were just talking about this. And so in Michaelmas term, when we had 1800 assessments, come in, students had a choice of about 15 algorithms they could choose from to, um, to analyze. And two of those algorithms had a, an explicit sustainability focus. So those are the ones that I showed you um, in the slideshow there. Um, we had, I, I'm pretty sure we don't have the exact numbers, but we had at least you know, 100, 150 students out of the whole cohort who chose those those algorithms um, to, to focus on. And in the Lent term where students have been able to choose their system and thinking about sustainability more broadly, we've had, again, probably at least, I would say 10 to 15% of our groups are focusing on a sustainability theme. So that, can, that gives you a little bit of a flavor of how popular, or I guess, pop, you know, quote unquote popular, or how common it is for first year students to engage with these issues, sort of um, select, self-select these issues for an assessment purpose. That's super, thank you very much, Gillian. Um, I see that we've been uh, uh, joined by Ganja uh, Sridhar, who is our Ganga. third speaker. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, am I putting you on the spot, Kanja, by saying, uh, would you like to take the floor or do you want to? Yeah, that, that's fine. Um, and apologies, I'm, I'm late for this guy. I just finished my office hours. Um, and my name is Ganga. Ganga, sorry. 
Yeah, and just a bit more naughty then um, for a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> so um, I could share my screen if that's okay, because I didn't want to forget um, the points I had down. It's very short, but no, it's you should really... be able to. It is enabled for everyone. Yeah. Perfect. Can thank you so much. This? Yeah. And thank Perfect. You. Um, so basically, um, I was asked to sort of go through my experiences with bringing sustainability into the classroom. Um, and basically, just to give you a bit of background, my um, background is um, in environmental behavioral economics, ecological economics, and environmental psychology. So bringing sustainability into the classroom is actually my job um, and my research job, apart from my teaching job. So in that sense, um, I'm quite happy to share this, and I hope it's useful for everyone. So there's four broad ways I've sort of thought I could have done that, which is first to integrate sustainability into teaching a quantitative methods course. That was the course I've initially was was allocated to when I when I joined um, the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Sciences, um, and it's not immediately one which might jump out at a person in thinking of oh how do we get sustainability in there, but because it was an applied course I had many opportunities to use sustainability related case studies. The second way is through supervising dissertations and also the LSC Public Research Partnership. I see Paul, nice to see you here. Um, and then the third is actually designing a dedicated course, and I can give you an overview of that. And the fourth is through external events through which students have been very active, actually. So the first one was um, the teaching. So I teach at the moment PB487, which is Quantitative Applications for Behavioral Science. The course aims to give students um, an insight into how to use um, and analyze from existing research papers, causal inference frameworks from hypothesis testing to more um, quasi econometric um, and quasi experimental approaches like differences and differences, et cetera. So um, the way the course is structured is very applied, which essentially means there's loads of um, opportunities to use um, applications from the environmental space, both in my lecture as well as in my seminars. So for an, ins for an example, um, there's quite seminal work about the role of moral licensing, the idea that people do one good thing, pro-sustainability thing, and then license themselves to sort of act naughty later because they've done the good thing first. So there's lots of examples of that from the, the context of actually green consumer purchases. So I used an example like that in my lecture um, and looked at the methods section. But in doing the methods and replicating those sorts of papers, we also had a larger debate about the topic itself. Um, and lastly, in, in the context of that, I've also had, for instance, workshops or focus group with my students about my own research, which enables them to sort of engage with the kind of work I do, which is in the sustainability space, but also from a quantitative lens. So, for example, we did a focus um, group uh, in last semester where I, you know, sort of piloted my survey with my students and then we fed it into things like survey design and the sort of data I'd be getting out of that and how we could improve it. The um, second thing is through dissertations. I supervise both executive level students as well as MSc level students, and a lot of the students who I supervise are interested in sustainability issues. Um, and often I've tried to liaise with organizations I have relationships with. So for instance, um, I have priorly, I have worked with the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, RSBB, which is one of the UK's largest um, nature conservation NGOs. And um, they had a data set which they needed to be analyzed. So one of the students um, in my MSc a few years ago did the analysis for them. Um, and this is where the public research partnership was very helpful. Um, so we, we organized um, with the help of, of Paul and, and, and the public research partnership team, um, an opportunity for my MSc and PhD student to kind of work with a, a pro-sustainability sort of green startup. Um, and that was very helpful to actually have a link with an organization who's trying to use insights from research in their real actual business practice. Um, other ways that research experience from the sustainability space, um, of course, is if, if anyone wants to assist me in my own research projects, um, like before. In terms of designing a dedicated course, this course, um, Behavioral Science for Planetary Wellbeing, will be launched next year. I'm currently in the process of putting the materials, et cetera, together. Um, but the course is a half unit over 10 um, weeks in the long term. It's an optional for the MSc in Behavioral Science um, program. And the um, idea is to actually look at what behavioral science can tell us about our own environmental behavior, both in the private sphere in terms of consumption, but also in the public sphere in terms of policy support, collective action, et cetera. Um, so this course was, um, I think, I'm, I'm really excited to be putting this together, um, but essentially it's got insights from 
ecological economics, from um, environmental psychology, social psychology, etc. Um, and I think this is really the first course in our department, which is really dedicated purely to to bringing environmental sustainability in, but it does build on a lot of other courses. For instance, the psychology of economic life and consumer um, psychology for sustainability. There are other courses which also have sustainability related things in, in them. So I think there's a lot of appetite from within our department for sustainability as a topic. So um, this is the other way I've sort of brought it into the classroom. And lastly, of course, there's external events. Because I wasn't able to offer this course to our students this year, I, I did a very I made a concerted effort to include a lot of sustainability related events so they would get insight into that material and those issues anyway. For instance, we have a PBS, um, the departmental seminar series, which I co-organize. And um, I had a speaker this semester and also last semester who did sustainability related stuff in the behavioral science space. Other colleagues in my department, as I said, are also really interested in this. So for instance, Fred Basso um, did something on the power of movement in plants. Laura Gurge, who's just joined as well, um, did something on corporate sustainability. Um, so that was one. The second thing is, and, and I, I ask all my MSc students to attend and there's a huge attendance from them and they really like the material and they often discuss it later. We also did a public event where I had um, Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh from the University of Bath to talk about her research. And all my students actually had, uh, they blocked off a room and, it, and attended the event in person and had a discussion after that. And they're very motivated and, and they really love doing stuff like this. So that was very lucky. Lastly, I was involved in a two-day workshop co-organized by um, LSE and the UCD, which is the University College Dublin, where we did a workshop behavior on environment and well-being and we invited all the students to come in and actually participate over two days so in a way these are the sorts of ways I've sort of tried to sort of bring that in I hope that was more or less efficient and clear even if fast it was absolutely super thank you very much indeed really great um, do we have any questions uh, for Ganga please anybody like to start the ball rolling on that Claire, Claire, I see your hand, and then Ellis. Ah, oh, yeah, Claire and Ellis. So let's go for Claire first. Yeah, thanks, Ganga. It was great to hear about the breadth and variety of your engagement. It's really, really inspiring. Um, I suppose one thing I wanted to ask you is because I think that sort of you know we're living in a we're living in a space where everyone is overloaded and overwhelmed, and and there's multiple kind of priorities for change. And yes, of course, they're overlapping in some ways, but um, and I just wondered, you know from your perspective of, of working with students in a whole range of different um, ways, I wonder how we can do more, what we can do more to harness that energy of our student population to sort of, to, 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 to push, to mobilize change, to mobilize um, our leadership, to create time, as Paul said, to create time for faculty to, 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 to do more in this space. And, uh, so I suppose it's just about sort of, you know, that power of the student voice and the student partnership to, to bring change to the institution and what your thoughts are on that? I think it's a good question. I think there's lots of really motivated students at LSE. We're very lucky that we've got so many people who are so passionate. It's just that they're passionate about many things. And I think sustainability is one of the things they're passionate about. Um, and that's why I think actually slipping it in to course curriculum, to extra events, um, et cetera, can really help just dovetail that. So you're not asking anything more of them. You're just asking them to dwell on a particular topic in a structured way. Um, I found that was really useful. So in a way, you're not asking them to do extra stuff. Like we've just set the standard that we'd love the, the MSc students to attend the PBS seminar series. So that's just something we encourage them to strongly do. And if they show up, the, the materials related to sustainability are there. Um, you know, the second thing, for instance, is the the core course, like the quantitative methods is a core course. <laughs> so in a way, like all the students have to do it, whether they care about sustainability or not. So by having sustainability related materials and applications in a core course um, that enables them to engage with it and maybe find it interesting. I just finished my office hours and one of my students who came in, um, she was saying, actually, I wasn't interested in sustainability. Now I have three assignments, which I've selected to do on sustainability. Um, and I was really interested in health. So in a way, I think actually giving students in a very, by not asking them to do extra stuff, by just sort of streamlining it into the activities they already do can be really helpful. Um, and also using extracurricular activities and events to make them feel like there's a sense of community can be really helpful. So the extra events that we did were really helpful 
because students then had stuff to look forward to, especially in the context of COVID when everything has been digital. So actually organizing them around those sorts of events uh, has, has, has been really helpful. I had lots of positive feedback when I trialed and piloted my survey with them. We just workshopped it together. And I think that was really interesting for them because they were like, oh, we learn about survey design. So it wasn't just about the environmental stuff. It was about survey design. It was about what does it mean to participate in a survey as well, which is very helpful for their dissertations if, if they're planning to use those methods, whether they're planning to analyze secondary data or whether they're actually planning to do their own experiments and conduct their own surveys. So in a way, I we've at least I've my approach has always been to try to dovetail it to stuff they already have to do rather than ask them to do more stuff. Um, so in a way, it just sort of mitigates effort all around. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Ellis. Thanks very much. Um, yes, uh, it's really fascinating. I um, My eye was drawn to the assessment for the new course you're designing, and it made me think back to something Paul was saying about how engaging with real life situations can make people engage better with theoretical stuff. And did I read it correctly that they have to come up with a case study proposal for, for an intervention? They'd have to kind of design an intervention themselves rather than just like analysing somebody else's. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering what you're hoping that that's going to additionally... So yeah, that's it's a good question. Thanks, Alice. So the the point of the, the so our behavioral science, it's partly reflective of the nature of the behavioral science MSc, which is quite applied and, and the idea is to really think about like how can you do behavior change for good. Um, and in this particular case, it's about like, for instance, if 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 students want to go out there, work with an organization who want to address sustainability in the workplace, for instance. Um, the idea is to give them the opportunity to, to pilot that and trial that within the course. So while we do the theory and, and all of that in the lectures and the seminars, the idea is to actually take that theory in an applied setting and design an intervention. For that, I'm planning to actually try to give them a real world case study or an example, um, you know, where I'm like, okay, there's this organization, this is what they need, how would you address the sustainability issue? do a case study in terms of give me your proposal and I'll give you feedback for the formative, but you develop that based on the feedback for the summative. So in a way they sort of go into greater detail um, based on initial feedback that they get. So the idea is to be very application oriented, but driven by theory. So in a way it would be theory testing in, 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 in the workplace, for instance, in that example I gave you. The other thing which I am going to do with them is probably like a half day symposium where everyone's given a different role. For instance, there's someone who's an activist, there's someone, a group of people who are corporates, there's someone who's a fossil fuel lobby person, <laughs> like, you know, really complicated and actually simulate um, discussions about like, how you would you address something like the climate crisis, but through the, the aspect of role taking and get everyone to do a presentation, like each group does a presentation. So in a way, it's sort of the idea there is to put them in the position of different people who might not, they might not initially align with just to give them the sense of actually how perspective taking can help address this because this is a collective action issue ultimately. So um, that was the motivation there and also to make it active and fun rather than here's this essay, which you should write. That's brilliant, absolutely super, really inspirational. And Stella, last question uh, from you, if you would. Hi, thank you and thanks uh, Ganga. Um, I just had a, a quick question, I think, on your what your thoughts are around. Um, because the previous two speakers certainly don't have um, sustainability as a core element of their, their research interests. And I was interested when you kicked off, you said, you know, embedding sustainability into teaching is my job. And I just wondered um, what your thoughts are on how we do this as, a, as an institution to embed um, sustainability into education and whether you know, the challenges that the, first, the previous two speakers spoke about, about this not being their, their role, the partnerships and the time needed to kind of learn about, um, about all of these things to kind of create really rich educational experiences for their students compared with your experience where it is your research focus and arguably maybe a bit easier for you and what you think, where you think the focus should be and whether you have any insight you know, from your colleagues in your department who perhaps don't have this as their a core research interest and how that's working for them? That's yeah, question. that's a great question, Stella. It's a tough one though, because um, for me, I just see sustainability implications everywhere. So in a way, 
I actually, um, so I'll give you the reverse. So for the quantitative applications, that was not my, you know, that was not my expertise, quantitative applications, right? It's like methods I use um, and I enjoy using those methods, but it's the to topic area. So I try to bring sustainability into it um, to highlight the methods. So I guess people could do it just the same way the other way around. So this doesn't mean that you have every case study in your course about sustainability. It could be that you have one week where that's a topic and you just do the minimum there, right? Like other subjects I had, everything, it, I had like applications from gun violence to, you know, so I had like many examples and sustainability was my one week example there. Um, the second thing was, I think some way which could be useful if you don't have the expertise is actually just get someone who does to come and have a chat. So, you know, just organizing a workshop for students um, where you say, okay, this is an interesting intersection and we haven't thought about this enough. And I'm just gonna have an external speaker come in and we can have a conversation. That actually has worked really well. And we use that model. I think um, Liam Delaney, who's the head of department, he has something called the Wider World Seminar Series, which we do with the MSc students, where we get lots of people who are external, who use behavioral science in the real world um, from different, so in, in terms of both like established as well as startup organizations to come and talk to students. So it could be just having an invited speaker as a part of the course. Um, and just the third way, I guess, is by setting assessments. <laughs> so it's a way I think to, or like setting seminar tasks where I think I've learned a lot from my students um, just because they've come up with particular discussion topics or et cetera. So in a way that could be just a way to trial, <laughs> you know, but that's just three things I feel like it's not at all exhaustive or clearly thought through, but hopefully. Superb, really great. Thank you very much, um, Ganga. And thank you everybody for your questions as well. And to the three uh, panelists speakers, um, I think uh, you've given us a, a lot of food for, for thought. And um, what I'm going to do now is uh, given the time is pop us into breakout rooms very quickly for about 10 minutes. I'm going to keep us in very small groups around three so that um, it's not too many people sort of uh, having to try to discuss together. Um, I think that would hopefully work and then bring us back out into uh, plenary. And I believe that um, Ellis might be giving uh, or helping to sort of summarize some of the feedback um, from her breakout room uh, and maybe open out to a couple of questions that might have arisen. So I'm going to do that now and let's We've see. got the room set up already. Uh, because we've got we're already set up. Wow. Yeah, well, we want to give people a chance to talk about something that was specific to them. So we've got um, we've got three rooms, uh, revising your curriculum, creating new curriculum and something that I've called it projects, partnerships, events. It's just kind of anything that you think might be a little bit more outside what you're normally doing. So um, if that's all right, can I let people pick where they're going? Absolutely. Please do. I'm going to let I'm going to hand over to you then to run the breakout room. Um, and if you have a look in the chat, I've created a, a whiteboard, which I hope you can access, don't worry if not, um, so that you can put some notes from the discussion up there as well. But uh, here the rooms should be. Um, and if you, apparently if you, if you look at them and you can just see a number of how many people is in the room, if you hover over that number and click, then you should be able to join the room.
that um, that's worked very well indeed. Yes, I'm going to pop into a room, I think, and um, try and get some things, but... No problem. Soon. Wait, when do you say we'll bring them back, Alice? Oh, um, you know, we didn't tell them, did we? That's... Yeah, I think 10 minutes was bandied about, right? Was, was that... That works. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if we bring them back at 40 and I do a super quick sum up. So thank, thank you. I'll, for... I'll, I'll handle that. That's fine. I'm going to dive into new curriculum because there's not many people there. Mm.